Welcome to Keith Knight, Don't Tread on Anyone and the Libertarian Institute. Today, I am joined by Kennedy Edwards. She is a wife, proud stepmother, pro-life libertarian, and the Libertarian Party of Ohio, Trumbull County Chair. She's also one half of the State of Ohio podcast. Kennedy, thank you for your time. Well, thank you for having me. I was looking at your Twitter profile, and you have a pinned tweet that says the following. Try to imagine a form of labor imposed by force that is not a violation of liberty, a transmission of wealth imposed by force that is not a violation of property. You are bound to conclude that the law cannot organize labor and industry without organizing injustice. What does that mean and why is it so profound? Well, it came from the book, The Law. Um, and I don't know, I... I was reading through it and I came across that part of the book and it just kind of stood out to me because a lot of people are so blue pilled and like on, you know, oh, well, this is a problem. So the law has to fix it or, you know, this is unfair. So the government has to fix it. And so um, I think that's a really good mental exercise to say like, OK, now try to think of this thing where you make it a law to make something fair that doesn't impose on somebody else's rights and try to think of this other thing that makes this other thing fair that doesn't impose on somebody else's freedoms. Like, I think that's a profound statement um, because I know a lot of times people get so fed up with, oh, we need this bigger thing above us, um, you know, to fix these like problems. Whereas, you know, you can't make a law that doesn't hurt somebody else. I mean, there's something in everything that's always going to infringe on somebody else's rights for one reason or another. And the only reason why we're imposing any of those laws is because somebody's feelings got hurt or, you know, somebody wants something to be fair or, you know, otherwise have an authoritarian person saying, no, you're not allowed to do this thing. And then people feel better about themselves. And I just think there's almost nothing you can do that, you know, apart from, you know, murdering someone's obviously wrong so you shouldn't um there should be laws against that but that's not like a like that's actually a helpful thing to do i think it's important for people to notice that like most of the laws that we have are infringements on some of our basic rights um and so that's kind of i don't know i thought that was like a really good mental exercise for people to think about um if they're thinking about oh well you just don't want any laws because you want to be like this wild, crazy person. It's like, no, I don't. Um, I just, I want people to have their rights and the best way for people to have their rights is to have less laws. And this is what the law does to people. So, Yeah, that is definitely an IQ test that you can basically give people when their first response is, you want freedom just so you can do, you know, what, uh, crazy stuff, scream at yeah. a stop <laughs> sign because it's oppressing you. The, the equivalent is, uh, you know, I heard someone say, I think it was Colin, I, I forget his last name. Um, he had said, well, uh, Elon Musk wants to buy Twitter. He's spending billions of dollars so he could make it a free speech zone, which mm -hmm. just goes to show you how bad some people just want to say the N word Th that like literally people think that that's what it's about. Like, like that's the after, only thing you could possibly want it. For. <laughs> what, what else is there to talk about? We CNN tells us everything we need to know. And, and Fox news, we get both sides right there. Uh, only an idiot would think that freedom is just about being to, you know, suck on rocks and stare into the sun without any sunglasses. Well, and I think that's like a, you know, that's how people view society, right? They think that if there's no rules and everyone's just going to be the worst version of themselves. And it's like, no, we'll just have like free conversations and we won't think about losing our jobs. Like people censor themselves because they think that, you know, their family members and their jobs and people close to them are just going to abandon them. And I think that's terrible. And it does happen. I know so, several people who have their families, um, you know, just shredded during the last two years. I think that's the worst thing possible. Um, and people just like have no faith that without rules, people would, you know, just be genuine. <laughs> and I think that's, I think that's crazy. I don't know. And it's almost impossible to avoid rules. Every time you make an exchange with someone, you go over to someone's house, they come over to your house, you meet at a restaurant. We're constantly engaged in this rulemaking. But for some reason, if there's not a third party coming in with an iron fist, threatening the rest of us, well, then that, then, uh, then we basically have chaos. As though yeah. rules aren't imposed by, by anyone else. What I love about this quote uh, that you chose to pin on your uh, profile 
is that it looks at rights as sort of an equation rather than just a thing. So if someone says, I want everyone to have an education, and if you're against that, you're against people wanting to have an education. Whereas if you understand that, everyone's positive right to an education then would mean that other people have the obligation to be forced to supply them with an education, with mm -hmm. construction workers that build the building and so forth. So I, I was so glad to see that that uh, was uh, pinned on your profile. <laughs> Any other main lessons from Bastiat that people need to appreciate? I think it's just like it's a very short book, so it's not like it's going to take up anyone's time very much at all. Um, but I think within the short amount of time that it takes you to read it, you're going to understand um, that the law, the government, he calls it the law throughout the whole book, but basically the government, it's just this entity that we're told from a small age is just this very important authoritarian thing to look up to. And he very clearly states how it infringes on just basic human level things like just the whole time and it's it's i think easy to comprehend and easy to understand that like yeah this is a different way to look at what the law is actually doing to us and it may be not you know maybe it's not this amazing thing that we need to be looking up to or having a lot of faith in and maybe it is something we need to be questioning and talking about and you know rolling back um and i think it's an important read for, you know, at least people who are at least stepping into the liberty sphere. Um, it'll give them kind of a perspective on um, why we think the way that we think and why we don't want as much government control and how um, it's not about being a crazy wild person who can say the N-word or go do insane things everywhere. It's about personal freedom. And um, I think he really spells it out for people in a very short amount of time. <laughs> which is nice. How is Christianity compatible with libertarianism? I think they go hand in hand. Um, I think, I don't, and I know there's a lot of libertarians who are atheists and I think that's fine. I mean, it's a personal choice for people. Um, I grew up sort of religious and then not, and then I came back to it. Um, I think the very core, you know, everyone thinks of libertarianism, I think of the non-aggression principle. And I think that's written out in the Bible. And I think the commandments, like the Ten Commandments, are also things, most of them, that libertarians follow anyways. I, I think they just go hand in hand. And I think they can work well together. But, you know, Christianity is this big umbrella term. Libertarianism is this big umbrella term. So you put two people in the same room together, there's going to be infighting in both of those groups. Um, I think it's the bigger, broader picture of, um, you know, like the Christianity values and the libertarian values. They're just like, here, this is how you be a decent human being. It's just like guidelines, I feel like. Um, and I think that they line up very well. I mean, it says in the Bible that you have the right to self-defense. If you kill someone in the middle of self-defense, it's fine. You don't get, you know, you don't get damned to hell for that. Um, and libertarians believe in self-defense as a basic human right. I think they just line up perfectly, um, in my opinion. Um, there's almost nothing that I've seen that doesn't go hand in hand. And of course, people disagree with it because they're like, well, you don't believe in um, an authoritarian figure and God's like this authoritarian figure. And I just, there's a, I think there is a difference in that um, because, you know, the government will do all sorts of horrible, horrible things and they don't care about you being a good person. They just want you to do what they're, you know, do what you're told. And I think that Christianity just wants you to live your life in the best way possible and I don't, I don't think that you have to be absolutely perfect within Christianity to at least get the principles and the healthy life, you know, that people Cer want. Certainly. Yeah. Uh, if you're a Christian who sees uh, everyone as God's children, certainly the last thing you would want to do is give one group of people the right to use violence unilaterally against yeah. them. That that would seem like a uh, certainly a crime against the creator. Now, whenever you hear the term 
pro-life it's usually used when it comes to abortion but if you had to explain what it really means to be pro-life how would you describe that well i think pro-life is you know abortion obviously comes up because that's a big thing but pro-life is also anti-war um and libertarians are anti-war and um, you know, not all Christians are. So I think that's sort of a downfall, but I, I have my issues with mainstream Christianity. Um, but, you know, if you're pro-life, you're pro-life. Like there's no reason to insert yourself onto someone else's property and start shooting them and bombing them. And, you know, whatever we're doing in Yemen and Libya and all those other countries, like there's, you're just killing people for the sake of who knows why we don't know. why. <laughs> like, I don't, um, and then, Abortion, too. I believe that, you know, life starts at conception. So you're just murdering another human being out of convenience. And I think that's terrible, too. I value human life from start to finish. And I don't think that anyone has the right to murder anyone else, um, whether it be in war or, um, you know, abortion or anything like that. I think that human life is the most sacred thing um, and it needs to be protected on all levels. And the only reason that an abortion should occur is if the baby is affecting the mother's life, which is very rare that that happens. And I think the only reason that a person should kill another person is if it's self-defense. Um, you know, I think those are very slim, small things that, you know, allow that thing to happen. And I think that um, if you're pro-life, you need to be pro-life from start to finish. Um, you know, I think sometimes humans just get very into this like battle thing where they everything's very selfish and it, it I think that's dangerous I think that's a dangerous quality um and that's something that I I fight to protect um when it comes to the primary objections to the pro-life case the uh the, the main one is well what if the mother's life is at risk which you dealt with that but assume that a woman is not just engaging in risky behavior and then has to bear the cost what if she is uh taken advantage of let's assume the worst case scenario she is raped against her will and is then pregnant would this justify an abortion because nothing she did intended to have this pregnancy, yet an obligation has been put upon someone who already has now faced something absolutely evil and traumatic? When it comes to the case of rape or uh, any form of uh, co coercion and forced sex, would that justify an abortion in uh, in your worldview? No. Um, and, I, <laughs> and that um, is shocking for some people, but... Um... I think rape is terrible. I mean, I hope it never happens to anyone else, and I, it sucks that it happens to anyone. Um, it, it is not that woman's fault that she got raped. It's also not the baby's fault that it was made. Um, and that baby didn't have a choice, just like the woman didn't have a choice in the situation. Um, and it's, it's another human who needs to be taken into consideration. And I know the argument against this is that, oh, well, the, the woman already went through this big traumatic thing and now they have to sit through nine months of pregnancy for a child they didn't want and the child's just going to remind them of the rapist. And um, then after birth, you you know, they're not going to want to take care of it. It's like, okay, well, that's when adoption can kick in. You can give the baby up for adoption. My main concern is keeping the baby alive. And yes, I I don't think that it would be a great time to be raped and then have to carry a baby for nine months, um, knowing whose baby it is and how I got pregnant. I think that would be a horrible experience. I'm not saying that this is like an easy thing to go through. I'm saying that the life of that child is more important than, you know, the trauma that the woman's going through. There's a lot of things in life that can cause long lasting drama and we don't, um, legalize murder to deal with that um abortion is nothing but legalized murder and the only reason why i make an exception um if the woman's life is in danger is because that's then the baby threatening the woman's life and in that situation the woman's life would become more important than the child's because the child would need the woman to be alive to you know come to term so in that situation then yeah her life is at risk so obviously terminate the pregnancy. Um, but rape is not an excuse, even as horrible as it sounds. I understand it sounds terrible, but you have to think of, 
both lives that are in that situation. That baby didn't ask to be made and the woman didn't ask to be raped, but they're both alive and they both need to be taken care of. And there's, you know, there's too much in this world that can happen to normal people without pregnancy and it causes trauma and it, and they're traumatized for a very long time. And unfortunately that does happen to people, but we, you know, you can't just legalize murder to deal with those problems. So we shouldn't legalize or have infanticide just because of this one bad thing. Um, that's just, I don't know, my opinion on it. My uh, favorite Antonin Scalia quote is uh, the transformation of charity into legal entitlement has produced donors without love and recipients without gratitude. When it comes to Jesus helping the poor, Christians, therefore, should also help the poor. Does this make Christianity and libertarianism incompatible, considering it's usually progressives talking about how to help the poor so much? I don't think so. I think libertarians are very charitable people. Um, at least the ones that I've met, they're way willing to help out people who are in need. Um, I've seen several times where somebody um, has been like struggling with their bills and so they make a GoFundMe. And even if people don't like that person, they're still um, giving what they can, even if it's just $5 or $10, whatever they have in their pocket, they're still, you know, donating because I think we genuinely care about people as a whole. Um, and I think, you know, because of that, we we are very charitable people and we do care to do those things. And, I, you know, progressives think of charity on a different level, I think, than, um, I don't know, conservatives maybe, or libertarians, um, because libertarians do it on a voluntary basis and progressives want it to be forced onto other people, um, I think is the difference. And um, Christians used to um, be very charitable. I mean, not that they're not these days, but I think it's different. I think Christianity, mainstream Christianity specifically, um, they're like convincing people that through taxes, they're helping the poor so they don't have to give to charity anymore. And charities, are, I think, are suffering because of welfare programs. Um, but if we go back to like basic times, I think that libertarians and Christians alike would go back to funding those things. I think they're both very giving people. Um, and I've seen it in church and I've seen it online. And I think they just go hand in hand. Again, they're just like, they're genuinely kind people who care about other people, even if they're people they disagree with. So. And having such a big government makes you much less likely to give to charity. One, because you say, well, I already pay taxes and that's for welfare and that already helps the poor. But mm -hmm. second, it turns people against each other in such an unnecessary way. It's like, well, I would help that person, but what are they going to do? Uh, get mm -hmm. better so they can vote for Trump, and then I have <laughs> to deal with Trump? Uh, what am I going to help them so they can uh, uh, get better and vote for Biden so I mm -hmm. could send more money to Ukraine? Mm -hmm. uh, so it's like, okay, well, now that we're in a war of all against all, since we're all fighting for the power of the state, we could have gotten along much better if it wasn't for this uh, giant uh, violent group of psychopaths uh, <laughs> yeah. tr trying to wield power over uh, one another constantly. So mm -hmm. it's, it's a major hindrance. It's not just like, well, I, I hope things will work out. The Catholic Church has given us great examples of how to be charitable in, uh, in the past. Any other things uh, that you have uh, when it comes to embracing the concepts of empathy or assisting the poor, the downtrodden, uh, blacks, women, anyone in these, uh, or uh, the people who uh, believe that they're a dif different gender than they were born with. Anything else on this, uh, just because Christians are seen as uh, d dumb bigots uh, who, ju who just hate everyone. <laughs> so uh, is there any other uh, myths you want to dispel on that? Okay, well, there are Christians who are, you know, they just go too hard in the paint on this. And I think it's, I think it's wrong. Um, and I think that it gives Christians a bad name because I, at least in my, my view of it, I think if someone's just a genuinely good person and then they also happen to be transgender at the same time that per, and they live by the same core values that a normal Christian would live by or a libertarian, you know, in my opinion, they're kind of one of the same. Um, 
I think that person has way more of a chance to get into heaven or to, you know, whatever you think the afterlife is um, than a person who shows up to church once a week and then otherwise just disregards it. And then they're just a horrible person the rest of the, you know, the rest of the time. And they just feel good about themselves because they decided to show up to church one time, like for an hour. <laughs> um, and I don't, you know, I don't think that every subgroup needs their special time of day or month of the year or anything like that. Um, I think that those people, if they need help, if they need things to get better for them, then they need less government and they need more people just living freely. Um, you know, if you prop yourself up as, oh, I'm a super special subgroup, then it's just like, no, because you're, you're making yourself better than the rest of the other people. And we're all just people trying to get through this thing called life together. And yeah, okay, so I disagree with how you're living your life. Does that mean that you deserve less things than I deserve? Absolutely not. We should all get through life the way that we want to get through life and, you know, sin however we feel like sinning. We all do it. It's not like we're ever going to stop. It, not one of us is going to be like the perfect godly person you know, and I think in a world where there's less government telling us how we have to treat each other, it's insane. Like, you can't say this word, you have to talk to people this way, and you have to be this, way. like, all these rules, it just drives people insane, and it divides people apart. But if you let people just come together, and if you go out into your communities, and you talk to people, and get to know them, and, you know, sort of you know, be a human being that's not plugged into the internet all day long, it's way easier to get along with people who are slightly different than you and live their lives slightly different than you, than, you know, than they want you to think. And I think that's something that we need to remember um, that, yeah, I can disagree with something that you're doing in your life, um, but still think of you as a whole person who deserves respect and kindness and, you know, help if you need help. Um, and I, I think sometimes people who are in, you know, the Christian atmosphere tend to be, come off as holier than thou and higher and mighty. And, and, and that's kind of like a stereotype of, oh, well, I'm a Christian, so I must be better than you, or that, at least that's how people view it. Um, and I just feel like that's just not true. Um, not one Christian that I know is a perfect person and they all do things that, you know, I might not want to be around or I disagree with and I do things that other people disagree with. And the, the, the beauty of it is that we get to come together and help each other when we can and live separately and be left alone when we want to be. Um, and I think that's I think if we start viewing things through that lens, um, then we can, you know, bring people closer together. I think what's happening right now is horrible because we're just dividing and at a rapid rate. Certainly. It almost seemed like there was a unilateral uh, disarmament by uh, Christians when it came to teaching, uh, having prayer in school or teaching the Bible. It more, you know, I, I wasn't around during the debates. I haven't done too much uh, research on it. But no, I mean, no Christian or Catholic or Mormon today is saying we need the Bible and the Book of Mormon and the New Testament taught in schools and we need prayer in schools. But by doing this, they've opened up a, uh, a the ability for progressives to say we need our completely irrational evil nonsense taught in all schools you have to pay for not only can it be taught you have to pay for the textbooks mm -hmm. that teach it so we're going to teach your kids to end up hating you and yeah. all these things you stand for mm -hmm. so in response to this uh a gentleman named michael heiss and Dave Smith and Scott Horton have developed the Mises Caucus, which you are allegedly an unapologetic member of, using, <laughs> bold, using bold messaging to fight back on these ideas that are being used uh, through state schools to be pushed on the rest of us. Mm -hmm. What is uh, so important about the Mises Caucus? Um, in regards to schools or just in general? In regards to anything, why does the LP need the LPMC? Why does America and the world need the LPMC? How can they benefit from it? Well, <laughs> I think... I think the LP needs strong, bold people 
I think they're lacking in that. I think the LP, for whatever reason, has been just filled with these people who like to bend the knee and, you know, kind of be palatable to the most people possible. And I think that's a hard thing to do. You're never going to bring in the most radical left. You're never going to bring in the most radical right. You're just going to, if, if, there, if we stay the same, we're just going to keep getting, you know, less than 1% of the vote or whatever it is, 1%. Um, we're never going to change minds and, you know, have people change their world because that's what it is you know you take somebody from the left or the right and their entire worldview just changes because you're not looking at it from this direction or that direction you're kind of like slanting them slightly and saying hey well this is what you've been taught since you were a child but why don't you look at it this way uh we don't have enough strong people in the lp the regime the libertarians and all of them that they just want they don't want to stir anything up and i'm not saying that we should be aggressive or mean or anything like that, but I think we should be um, changing people's minds or at least giving them something to think about or having them see things from a different perspective. And the way that you do that is by saying things in a bold way, um, being brave in times where it's uncomfortable, you know, talking about Yemen right when everyone's up in arms about Ukraine that's uncomfortable because people are very emotional about that topic, but that's an important thing to point out is that, hey, you're being led down this path um, because the media is telling you to, but this is something that nobody's talking about and you're not mad about it because nobody's told you about it. Um, or, you know, Ron Paul, whenever he was on stage with Rudy Giuliani and, you know, said, well, maybe they wouldn't come attack us if we were not over there attacking them. That was an uncomfortable thing for him to say in front of everyone. But he said it anyways. And we need more brave people like that. People are too afraid to speak out because of the, you know, and I, I get it. I mean, people are losing their jobs left and right because of their political views or what they say online and this and that and the other thing. And I get that it takes a certain amount of confidence and a specific sort of living situation to be able to confidently go out there and say things that are otherwise unpopular. Um, but I think those, those are things that need to be said. And Dave's not afraid to say them, you know, on big stages. And, you know, Michael Heiss is doing a beautiful job, you know, recruiting people and getting more people involved. And, you know, Angel McArdle is doing a fabulous job going around from state to state to state and talking to people. And I mean, it's just this big, huge effort. Um, and, you know, I think a lot more people w would be into it if they heard the messaging. Um, and good messaging comes from strong people. Um, and we need strong people. And we don't have strong people in the LP. And uh, we don't have strong people in our government. We don't have strong people, you know, I'm just here in Ohio. The politicians, I've been watching the debates because we're going through a primary right now. They're weak. Like, not one of them was, like, mind-boggling or... You know, not one of them made me think about something in a different way. They're all just like this same flat line. Like they have specific talking points they're allowed to talk about, but they won't talk about anything out of that realm. That's terrible. People are bored. I know a lot of people are just like they, they hate the left. They hate the right. They don't know where to go. They have no idea that there's a libertarian party or no faith in it at all uh, because we don't win elections. And it's like, OK, well, let's recruit all of those people. Let's have bold messaging that gets them thinking like, hey, here's a movement that we can actually get on board with. Here's something that doesn't sound like the same boring five topics that is politically correct and okay to talk about. Here's people who actually have something to say. They have solutions to problems. They have a plan. They want people to join them and just get on board and, you know, go out there and actually make some change happen. And I know in Pennsylvania, they're, you know, They've elected over 200 or so um, libertarians on you know the local level. I think that's fantastic. I want to do that here in Ohio. And I think the Mises Caucus is like the best way to do it, um, in my opinion, mostly because their principles and the people at the top, like, you know, Dave especially, um, but Joshua Smith too, and people like all the talking heads their values line up with everything that I've always thought 
were great things to do. Um, and everything that I've always, you know, held dear to my heart, it, it it's like finding a home, you know, and that's why I joined because I was like, this is a beautiful philosophy, the way that they talk about it, how bold they are when they talk about it, how they're not afraid to take on people who think that they're going to like get one over on them and like, oh, well, I'm going to make fun of you online. And they're like, that's fine. You can make fun of me online because I, I'm right. And I'm going to prove to you that I'm right. And I'm going to be right, you know, 99% of the time. So um, I think it's important for people to have a third option because I think right now a lot of people are lost. And the unapologetic bold messaging is why I enjoy watching people like Jimmy Dore, who I disagree with, but cannot stand MSNBC. I mean, <laughs> it's wrong and incredibly boring. Yes. At least when, when Jimmy Dore's right, he's right. And if mm -hmm. MSNBC is ever anti-war, which I haven't seen him in years, mm -hmm. they did... Uh, they did have a great uh, documentary called Hubris, and that was after Iraq. But it's like every other intervention since then, they have totally cheered. And they haven't really been against Iraq on uh, principled grounds. And a lot of them supported it when it went up for a vote. So you have this, oh, yeah, well, uh, I, I guess we're anti-war because that money could be used uh, to help people in America instead. As if mass murder is like a cost-benefit analysis. Like, I was going to be a serial killer, but then I ran the numbers, and it turns out <laughs> yeah. I, can't, I can't get a low-interest loan now, so I'm not going to be a serial killer. I mean, mm -hmm. dear God, does that just put you to sleep and make you think the person is like a useful idiot for evil? Well, actually, in this that case, they absolutely are. But in yeah. general, as far as, you know, the, the viewers... It was funny, as you were saying, you know, boring people who are in politics, who use the same five, you know, talking points. I was thinking, who fits that perfectly? And I was thinking, and the name John Kasich came to mind. And then I go, Is, isn't he from Ohio? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He I was gonna, it, it was either Ohio or Arkansas. And I go, well, I, I guess she really is in tune to what's going on in, <laughs> in Ohio. I didn't even, okay, I didn't even know he wasn't the governor anymore until the lockdown started <laughs> <happening>. <laughs> That's how boring Ohio is. It's, like, so bad. I was like, who's this DeWine guy? Why is he on TV? And I was like, oh, he got elected. All right. Well, he sucks, too, and he's also a weak figure in the politi political sphere. Like, he's just horrible. Um and it's not just that he calls himself a Republican and he's actually a Democrat. Like, it, that's annoying. But it's like, he speaks to you on TV and you're just like, you wouldn't stand up to anything for anyone. You got in this p position for God knows what reason. And it, he's not a leader. He's just this, like, squirmy little man who's the governor for some reason. And I just, I, I would value a governor who was bold like you know like DeSantis maybe not so, <laughs> so much of a Trumpian type but somebody who you know when they're speaking they mean it and they're standing up for their people and they're not going to take bullshit from the government the you know the higher up government I think the local elections are very important and I think we need more strong people who say strong things we don't need these weaselly types who are just like politically correct like DeWine for oh, he won't ever take a position on something until yeah. last second and it's just it's horrible he'll sign in like we got rid of um uh we used to have um you had to duty to retreat is what it was called we, we had we used to have duty to retreat so if you're in an altercation your duty and you were carrying a gun your duty was to basically walk away <laughs> like run away as fast as you can um and and he we repealed that and he i remember him saying like i'm only signing this because you guys want me to but i really wish you guys would work on gun reform and i'm like you freak like that tries me that's like oh i'm only doing this because you want me to it's like mm -hmm. you suck so bad like you're the worst governor <gasps> and he also came out and said that he doesn't he's like he's not sorry for how he handled the lockdowns and i'm like you gotta go like you gotta, like you gotta get out like this is terrible 
have you seen the um uh, the woman competing with uh DeSantis? Yeah, I hate so much. <laughs> so so I uh, it's it bad as and by the way, I just picked her because uh she it, it's going to be like the most popular race. Oh, I sure. forget I, I forget when this is happening. But if you look at this, all right. So right when you go to her official site, it says we can't bring hashtag something new to Florida alone. Make a donation to help power our movement today. So, uh, okay, very trendy. Uh, you can donate 420. <laughs> this the, the only site that is worse than this was mm -hmm. Justin Amash's site in, oh, really? gosh, what was it, 2016? I had to do a video <laughs> on that. But so when you look at this, the meet Nick, she, uh, there's an accomplishments page as well, but there's not an issues page, so you don't get to really nail her down. Really? The big quote... Sadly, no. You can uh, look at the accomplishments and updates. Accomplishments just showed up today, by the way. So the, <laughs> the, the website's been updated. But updates, shop, take action. Espanol, donate. Um, okay, so so here is the one and only quote she has that she wants to grab people's attention with. And the quote, <laughs> and, and the quote is, I'm somebody who always likes to ruffle feathers. And then, it's, and then everything else is hashtag something new. Wow. It, which I mean, I I, I guess uh, m me uh, starting to uh, shoot people—that is something new. Um, socializing medicine—that's something new. Uh, <laughs> invading a country in Europe. Hey, that sounds like something new. <laughs> it's we, brand new. We haven't done that since what 1812. We right. haven't had a real get to go. That's something new. I mean, it is just so ridiculous what grabs people's attention. N nowadays is there anyone obviously you know uh, i would love to see dave smith um get on rogan more and uh mm -hmm. get on uh you know a debate stage is there anyone else who even catches your eye i mean desantis is probably the best right now yeah so i think desantis um he has that strong um quality that i'm looking for in a candidate um problem with desantis is like if he really cared about children in schools, he would give them school choice in Florida. Um, genuine school choice, not what we're doing in Ohio. Um, sorry. <laughs> um, but instead he's, you know, writing all these laws for what they can and cannot teach in public schools. Um, and in a perfect world, it would be like school choice. And if one school does the CRT thing and the other school doesn't, and one of them wins, like that's the free market. That's what I want um, to see. Um, is it attractive to see, you know, all these laws that he's passing to kind of get into the culture war? Like, sure. Yeah. I want, it, it's fun to watch. Um, it's it's just not perfect. And I think, you know, Dave would look at it similarly. He wouldn't pass laws, I don't think, but he also doesn't think it's unreasonable. I don't think it's unreasonable what they're doing, um, but it could be better, I guess, is my point of view. Um, but, you know, I don't see any boldness coming from almost any other state. I think the rest of the red states are kind of just following in line with what Florida's doing. I think they're letting him take the lead and taking all the heat. And then they just kind of do the same thing, like behind the, behind the curtain. Um, at least that's what Ohio does. Like as soon as DeSantis did the, um, don't say gay bill, um, we introduced our own and I'm like, okay, well, the bold thing to do would be to just be the first one, one time, but mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's, Everyone needs a leader, I guess, even in politics. Um, but yeah, no, I think I think Dave's fantastic. I think he needs to get on more stages and keep spreading everything that he says. And he says it very well. And that's why he does what he does. Um, I think Josh Smith is also a good person. Um, he even went to, you know, he's been traveling to different um, state conventions. And I think when he was in Boston, they went to a school board meeting and they made them go to a special session because something or other. They just, I mean, I think that's fantastic. He went out and, you know, he doesn't even have kids in that school system, but he fought for them anyways. So. Yeah. When it comes to the uh, DeSantis approach, the reason that I support that is one, we're getting into issues that people really care about just because mm -hmm. it affects them directly. What your kid learns in school is 
sadly worth all the lives in Ukraine. I mean, yeah. look, 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 look at how much time you spend feeding people in Ukraine and how much time you spend feeding your own kids. Can we not lie about this, please? So one, we're tapping into something people really care about. We're going to pull them in with that. Then we'll get mm -hmm. them on the Federal Reserve later. On the back <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. It, it's like the supermarket that keeps the good products way in the back. They yes. got to pull you in with Cheetos and stuff and monsters. So, um, th so there's that. Second, you're raising the cost of people who just love the state so much they want more government and everything else. You're making it less pleasant. So this thing they love is now a bit of an inconvenience that they can't talk about mm -hmm. whatever nonsense that they want to push today, regardless of what it is. So second, you're raising the cost of bad actors to operate. And then third, I knew I had three. What the heck was the third one? Um, I, I guess the third would simply be uh, that is not something that I want to be allocating money to. When you look at sex education, you can read Thomas Sowell's excellent book. Gosh, I think it's The Quest for Cosmic Justice. Um, it's uh, the, the Vision of the Anointed, it's titled. And he says, you know, we're told we got to have sex education. This way, uh, pregnancy goes down. But after sex education, there was a drastic increase in pregnancy, even though there was also an increase in access to birth control mm -hmm. at that time. So these things, they don't even work. And they're totally unjustified. I don't want any state expanding its powers into this and that realm. I don't think it's bad at all to say, hey, with those uh, with the billions you steal, small caveat, no getting to be a pervert to three year olds. I think um, though, I don't think it's unreasonable at all. And I think it's a great mm -hmm. thing that it's happening. I think um, it's really um, telling which teachers are quitting because of it. It's like, that's great. Get out of the school system. <laughs> um, <laughs> like I went to K through 12, please. Not just yes, third grade. That would be fine with me too. I think that's mm -hmm. really something that's a real conversation that needs to happen between the parent and the teacher or not the parent and the child. Um, and I think some mm -hmm. parents are just uncomfortable with that topic. Um, and it's always going to be an uncomfortable topic, but the parents are going to know when the kids are ready to hear that content. And it's, obviously not going to be from kindergarten to third grade like that was it kindergarten to third grade who in their right mind wants to talk to a kindergarten that's okay by the way five to ten years old never comes up in conversation like i don't know <laughs> what these people are thinking about um but you know i used to teach in preschool i used to teach two-year-olds and i had a co-teacher um who would sit down with my two-year-olds and I put an end to it thankful like thank god I was in there but like she would sit down and be like yeah well sometimes I feel like a girl and sometimes I feel like a boy and I'm like oh my god like you cannot sit down with two-year-olds who don't even know what girls and boys are by the way like they're still figuring that out and have this conversation with them it blew my mind that that person decided to work with children. It's like, okay, well, if that's in daycare, who's working in the public school system? Like, that's insane. Um, but, you know, I think it's driving out the bad teachers, which I think is fantastic. Um, and I think it's, you know, catering to people, because we are in a pretty hot culture war right now. And I think this is catering to people who are against all that stuff. And I, and I do like it. I like what I'm seeing, and I'm not super against it. Um, but just on principle, in a perfect world, we would have like that free market sort of system. You know, I am a little ashamed at how I approached the uh, the first time I saw an adult talking about uh, transgenderism to a child. I'm curious <laughs> how you responded and what you were able to do that you thought was successful in this case. Uh, well... <laughs> So we were co-teachers. We were supposed to have the same amount of responsibility in the classroom. Um, I ended up just having most of the responsibility. She wasn't a very reliable person. <laughs> um, I would distract the children. Um, that was my, my, my first priority was to get them just to go do something else. Uh, my second priority was to talk to management um, you know, and I said, I don't want to bring my political views into the classroom. And I certainly don't want her to bring her political views in the classroom. And this is mm -hmm. a very touchy subject, but I think this is not something that 
needs to be said to the children. And, and you know, they agreed with me. I didn't want them to come off thinking that I was this bigot who was unaccepting and this and that and the other thing. I wanted to like delicately put it to rest so that she didn't feel like I was attacking her as a person, even if I disagree with her. Um, because, you know, she could have easily taken it that way. So I brought it to management and she, um, I eventually just got her out of my classroom. I was like, if you guys aren't going to fire her, like, I don't want her in here talking to my kids, you know, put her somewhere else. Um, because this is what she's doing and we don't work very well together anyways. And so they eventually just took her out and then she quit. So it was fine. But, um, my biggest priority in that moment was to distract the kids and get them to go do something else because, you know, they're two, they don't need to hear me yelling at another adult about mm -hmm. like how inappropriate that is. Um, and the best way to distract two year olds is just give them something to do. I mean, it, it wasn't like she knew I was like going after her or anything. I just, you know, did my thing. I was like, let's go do this activity and they would get up and go do something. So, um, yeah, that that's really good. Um, the, the only thing, the only time I've really been able to grab their attention is when I've kind of, uh, uh, it opens the door for the uh, the, the toxic masculinity, when, <laughs> which at this point is just hilarious now. Yeah. It's as funny as racist was yeah. uh, a, a, a few years ago, which is why they've had to elevate it to white supremacy. Is what they <laughs> yeah. So what, what I, um, so what I said was, why are you talking to um, kids about sex or gender you're really mm -hmm. prioritizing this thing that i never would have thought uh what would be such a big deal and they said well uh gender is what's in your mind sex is what you're born with and those are two different things so i this is one of the few times i've yelled in a professional environment but i said well is there uh, should we have you know what age kids really are and what age they identify with the race that they are and the race they identify with like if kids start coming to school in blackface i actually knew a woman who said she was a black woman trapped in a jewish woman's body <laughs> and was going on to ancestry.com just to con just to confirm what she already knew and then was in a state of shock that she had only european <laughs> she was like i can't she goes I watched uh, the the Blind Side with Sandra Bullock and cried the whole time. I, I thought oh it was because I, I I could relate to these people. So people you are ask so them, broken. I, I know it's so sad they don't have anything to like lean back on. Mm -hmm. I mean, when Katy Perry said, "If you stand for nothing, you you'll fall for anything," I was mm -hmm. like, "Hey, that that's finally, true." <laughs> a good message yeah. from uh, fr fr from the uh, the the pop culture, right? But yeah, just getting I just really got. Uh, uh, so upset with it because it just seems so agenda driven, but I couldn't put my finger on it. What the heck is going on? I suspect it's that the weaker men and women are, they're less likely to compliment each other and they're more likely to look to the state and the state doesn't have the hurdle of the uh, strong male female bond to go over so they could rule over all of us. But maybe that's wrong. Either way, if there's no agenda at all, I think it's still unjustified. It's just like saying, look, I'm Chinese. I, I feel like it. And I'm, I'm a 65 year old black woman. So mm -hmm. give me social security. Uh, yeah. I'm 65. I identify. And you're a bigot if you don't believe me. <laughs> you're bigoted. No, I, I, I think you hit the nail on the head. I think uh, men and women both are way more fragile these days than they used to be. Um, and we're falling apart because we're losing what it means to be each gender. Um, women are trying to not just be men, but be better than men. And men are just becoming weaker and um, more feminine. And, you know, think of that how you will, but that's how we get to where we are right now in this culture war, because um, we're not complimenting each other. We're not honing in on our very unique capabilities. I think it's beautiful how different men and women are on a basic level and how women have instincts um, and men have instincts and they're different and they complement each other. And if you hone in on those and work together as, you know, a pair, you can really create something beautiful. And it's a very strong thing that you can create because you work off of one another and where one person is strong, the other person will, you know, not be so strong, but, and that's okay because 
you know, where this person is strong, this person is not strong. So you're just like helping each other meet in the middle and you're just creating this environment um, where you do work as a team. And right now, I think a lot of people just like mental health is declining horribly. Like people I grew up with, and I'm on the younger end, but people who I grew up with are just always so lost and so depressed and so sad all the time because they just don't have a purpose in life. They have nothing to look up to. And so they're just looking to the government and they're, you know, trying to fit in to whatever the culture war is right now. They're trying to be politically correct. And if you're trying to do that, it's difficult. Like men are being told not to be masculine. And so they're like, okay, then what do I become? And so they're just confused. It would be the worst thing in the world if somebody told me I'm not allowed to be feminine. Like I would be, I would be distraught and I, you know, my mental health would decline too if I wasn't allowed to do the things that I get to do all the time and things that I love doing. Um, you know, like taking care of my stepdaughter and taking care of my home and, you know, doing all the things as a wife that I like, those are things that are in me, like core things about me as a person. And if you're trying to keep up with what society or the government, what they're trying to tell us to do, it's, I feel inhumane because it's telling you to go against your instincts and, and, of course people are confused and of course people are just declining in their mental health and doing wild and crazy things that we we haven't seen in a very long time it's because they're being told to do things that don't make any sense and so they're just like trying to find something that is consistent and it's heartbreaking for me to see it all happening and especially to people who i think could be better if they would just give it up like stop letting the media and society whatever it is that's telling you to do these things like that's why your mental health is on the decline that's why you feel lost that's why you're depressed all the time it's because you're trying to please all these other people but you're not helping yourself and um i think that's another thing that makes libertarianism amazing because you get to be an individual and you get to do whatever that feels like to you um and right now, I feel like we live in a world where you're not allowed to be an individual because if you're an individual, then you're not, you're killing grandma or, if you're, you know, you're whatever they're telling you. Um, and I, I think that really hurts people and it breaks my heart to see it happening. Yeah, it, it's like they hurt both the individual and the collective. So mm -hmm. but you, first of all, if you want... Uh, to not have half your money stolen to murder uh, civilians in Iraq. Well, obviously that's greedy. Now, um, your race is basically a bunch of colonialist slave owners, and the country you're from was founded on Native American mistreatment. So yeah. it's like, all right, so who are my groups? Because anytime I engage in philosophy, well, the state has monopolized compulsory education. So it's not like we have great competing ideas where people find their identities in philosophical camps either. So it's like they're totally wrecking any semblance of a peaceful community mm -hmm. that people can have. And I think that's why Hoppe's um, explanation at the end of Gosh, I forget. I think it's called Libertarian Quest for Grand Historical Narrative, where it says anytime you start an organization, even if it's like a whiskey drinking club, that fights the state because it's camaraderie with other people. It's a competing allegiance that people can have that isn't towards the state, whose goal is to have no competing allegiances and a monopoly on authority. Yeah. So I, I love what you said about how differences can complement each other, because the scam is... Um, employers uh, benefit at your expense or the races have to be divided or the genders have to be divided or the ages have to be divided. It, everything has to be divided with the state. But in the market, it's all complementary, assuming the actors are uh, engaged in the interaction voluntary. Mm -hmm. But what a uh, t terrific uh, observation. Well, and I also think like the Christianity comes in there, too because people it's it's fashionable right now to be against religion like it's not popular to be a religious person i feel like right now and so i think that's another reason why people are lost because they don't have something 
that shows them good values, good, healthy, working values that lead you in a healthy living situation. That's something that I always look for is like, am I living my values? Am I working towards something that's healthy and, you know, something that will help me thrive um, is very important to me in Christianity. Whether you believe in God or not, you have to sort of be honest. If you look at the core principles, it's like, yeah, you can follow these principles and not believe in God and live a very healthy, satisfying life. Um, and I think that's what's beautiful about it um, because you can, you can just, live those values and believe in God or don't believe in God, but at least those, that gives you a starting point. And once you have a starting point, then you have purpose and you can use those values and your purpose and then create a beautiful life for yourself. But people don't even have the starting point. They don't have the set of values to guide them. Um, and I think it's hurting everyone because of it. Certainly. So I want to go through a couple more questions here. Um, first of all, you uh, gave me, well, we talked about The Law by Bastiat. Uh, mm -hmm. Here are four other books you told me are some of your favorites. Give me the primary lesson that you learned from reading Mere Christianity. So Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis, um, I think it's a phenomenal book. I, I actually listen to it on audio um, while I'm at work. And I've listened to it several times. And every time that I listen to it, there's something new that I get out of it. But I think what's incredible about it is that C.S. Lewis was very much um, an atheist. And he dove into Christianity because he wanted to prove it wrong. And by the time that he was done, he was a hardcore believer. And because not only could he not prove it wrong, but he kind of came to the conclusion himself that it's unquestionable. Um, and the way that he describes it, is so much more palatable than um, mainstream Christianity right now. Um, because, you know, in the mainstream, they'll tell you like, well, you have to follow this, 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 and this, or you're a horrible person, you're going to hell. And he describes it in a much more beautiful fashion that allows you to still be an individual person. And, you know, it kind of brought me back into my, my faith because I, you know, I was turned away from it for so long. And then I think what he does is he makes it, he makes it so you can still be this individual person and find your own way towards God um, without feeling pressured or, you know, my main thing was like, I don't like going to church because I feel like people who go to church a lot, a lot of them are like phonies and it made me feel comfortable just finding my own faith by myself in my own home um, and on my own time. I think that he does a beautiful job explaining like where he was in the beginning and how he found his way back. And it really does encourage people, at least it encouraged me um, to deep dive Christianity again and to come back to it. And I think it's only been helpful I don't think there's, you know, anything that's been bad about it. Um, and I think it's, you know, I don't know. I, I think it's grounding. And I think people need that right now. How about the book Biblical Womanhood? So Biblical Womanhood I put on there. Um, it's actually a workbook. Um, but it takes you through the Bible and it does different subsections um, of your life. Each chapter is a different area, like raising your kids and this and that and the other. Um, I like biblical womanhood, not because I agree with it completely, but because it challenges your belief system. So I always thought of myself as a pretty traditional wife um, with traditional sort of values. And this showed me that um, I still hold on to things that I thought so like I grew up with a strong, independent mom, and I thought that I was way further away from that than I was. And that book kind of challenged me on that and it helped me um, view things differently. And even if I still don't agree with a lot of the things that are in there, like there's a whole chapter on, you know, there's a chapter on disciplining your children and it really 
goes into spanking and I'm not in, I think that's child abuse. Um, but even that, I got to read through it. I got to read the, the sections in the Bible and apply it to my life and either agree with it or disagree with it. But what it really does is it makes you take a look at how you're living your life and um, it, it gives you perspective, I think, um, from a Christian point of view. How about getting libertarianism right? So that book is, um, I think the title is fun because it's like getting it right, but also from the right, if you read it. Um, I think that's an important book to read if you want to understand the difference between a left libertarian and a right libertarian and why the left libertarians fail or have been failing and why if there is a bunch of right libertarians um, why they may succeed on a more bold level um, kind of how I see the Mises caucus right now how they're more bold and um, can bring in a lot more people to the party how about finally for a new liberty so for a new liberty I think is just a basic liberty book that anyone who's starting to come into the liberty sphere um, should read because if you want to know what sets libertarians apart from the left and the right, why we're different from Democrats and Republicans, why we're a solid third option, how we see the world differently, it's all written out in that book and it's a longer read, but I think it spells it out perfectly. And as I was reading it, it was just like, yes, I feel like I'm reading about myself. Um, <laughs> and I think it's I think it's a perfect book to start someone off with, you know, to at least show them like, this is why we're different. This is why we think the way that we think. Um, but, you know, I, I think if somebody was brand new, that would be something to give them. Kennedy, where can people find your podcast and collection of work? Uh, my podcast is on YouTube and on all podcatchers. So um, whatever you use, Spotify, the podcast app, whatever. I don't know. There's like a bunch of them. It's on all of them. Um, and I'm on Twitter at Liberty Broad. Um, and that's it. Links will be in the description below. Thanks to everyone for watching. Keith and I don't tread on anyone and the Libertarian Institute. Kennedy Edwards, thank you so much for your time. Thank you.